Hello. Hello.
Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. And you can see me as well, I assume. Perfectly. Okay, wonderful. And can you see what I'm sharing? I'm sharing, I'm seeing all the, the window uh, in the screen. I think that you should put on play. Exactly. So I can see it and I, and I will exactly. see everything perfectly. You're right. Okay, excellent. I will get mute because I got some noise on my side. Right, right.
We have four more minutes. Uh, you can hear me, right? Okay, perfect. Fatma is also here. Hello, hello. Hi, Arthur. Hey, man. How's it going? Very good. How are you? Exhausted, but excited. Mm -hmm. Especially for the webinar. Perfect. All right. Just give me a minute. Yep. And then I'll introduce you and we'll kick it off. Right. All right. Yep. Okay. Thanks everyone for jumping in. Uh, and thanks Sagar for um, offering to, to host this webinar. Um, I'll, I'll quickly remind everyone that you're a mathematician that is working in finance. 
uh, you have 10 years of research experience as a geometer, and you're currently interested in spatial and geometric methods and data science. And you're also enthusiastic about knowledge structures and pattern languages. So the idea behind this session, this webinar, is to help data scientists who face the challenge of having to gain the main knowledge of diverse fields and work with multidisciplinary uh, teams. So yeah, we're hosting this webinar, uh, hopefully to help that challenge. So I'll let okay. you kick it off. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Arthur. Um, yeah, and it's, it's such a joy to be able to interact with a community that is uh, engaged in a really, um, I think, a critical cause uh, at this point, um, you know, uh, and it gives me immense pleasure to be able uh, to serve uh, the community in a way um, that they might possibly find useful. So thank you all for this opportunity. And uh, I'm assuming that you all can see uh, what is being presented on the screen. Um, we can. Right, perfect. Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead, uh, we'll kick start this uh, session. And uh, so let me sort of, uh, you know, tell you what uh, actually led me to, uh, to the idea of, of, of having this webinar, you know, so uh, everything started with uh, basically me stumbling upon the CORD-19 challenge and uh, the unique uh, uh, sort of ask that that, uh, that Kaggle competition, you can say, I don't know if you can call that uh, a competition anymore, uh, but that invitation to collaborate on the Kaggle platform um, was unique in the sense that there was no um, quantitative measure of determining whether uh, a contributor had, had actually uh, managed to complete the task at hand. And while that did not uh, strike me as a new circumstance, I imagine that for a lot of Kagglers, this would strike as new and uh, it, to a certain extent even intimidating because uh, it is not clear when one says that we would like to know what is known about uh, uh, certain topics in a field uh, what does that what does that mean? What should an appropriate response to such a question be? And yet uh, we ask this question to ourselves uh, almost every day because we are in the business of acquiring information and using it uh, to make decisions, right? Uh, so we will look into that uh, more closely. We will uh, we will bring our attention to this process of acquiring information and building structures that we perform every day so that we become aware of the tools. And then uh, because of this awareness, it leads to a more efficient use of these tools, which we already have. So whatever I say today, uh, a lot of that will sound like uh, I'm pointing to your limbs, which you already had, but you probably didn't know that, you know, you were using them all the time. So don't be surprised if whatever I say today you already know, uh, but I'm only giving you a language uh, through which you can think about it, right? So we begin with, um, okay, let me, okay, yeah, I think uh, the way to change these slides is to click, not, not the keys, all right. So there are two questions uh, that uh, we as uh, human beings encounter uh, in our day-to-day -day life. And when I say a human being, I mean a human being in search of knowledge. Yeah, and, and that we all do to uh, a larger or a smaller extent. So the first thing that we ask is how, how did the structure become so complex? So whenever we come across a new body of knowledge, uh, the first uh, instinct is uh, to get intimidated because there is just so much to see, you know. It is like saying that uh, if you come across a tree that is sprawling across the garden, you know, uh, occupying about a third of the garden with all its branches and leaves and barnacles and uh, all of that, and the, 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 the you know, multitude of birds and organisms that live in it. So the tree is this entire ecosystem. And when you look at it for the first time, you wonder how, 
how did it become so complicated, right? So that's the first question. And the second question is, uh, where do I start? I mean, if I want to understand this system, how do you, how do you understand it? I mean, what is the starting point, right? So these are the two, the two questions that come to us when we are learning a subject or um, as in our case, um, you know, trying to uh, survey uh, the body of knowledge that is available to us. Uh, we want to be able to answer these questions, right? And so uh, to answer these questions, I'm going to take the analogy uh, of architecture, okay? And uh, there is a reason why I want to uh, refer to architecture. Uh, and when I say architecture, I mean the architecture of the buildings that we live in, the gymnasiums that we visit, you know, the cafes that we spend our times in. I mean, we do, we're only uh, confining ourselves to our homes because of the circumstances, uh, but that just uh, emphasizes uh, the, the importance of architecture in our lives. And my claim is that uh, the, the systems of knowledge have a very close relationship to the architecture, the physical architecture that we see around us. So we're gonna take a look at that. And uh, I'm, I'm claiming that uh, the, the, the physical architecture is a, an appropriate analogy to the system of knowledge uh, uh, because they both serve a, a similar function, okay? Uh, architecture as such is supposed to meaningfully and positively resolve the natural forces that uh, occur in nature. For example, you know, it will keep your room well lit. A, a good house, a good house that has been built thoughtfully will keep your room well lit with natural light, but it will make sure that you're not exposed to excessive sunlight, right? It will also make sure that the breeze in your room is regulated, but you won't have to face harsh winds or heavy rain, right? So the forces of nature are meaningfully resolved by physical architecture. And in that sense, knowledge is also a house that we live in, you know, in many ways. Because, uh, you know, as data scientists or as people who are curious, there's nobody who knows this better than us, that when there is a lack of knowledge, there is actually fear. And uh, because of the training that we have received, we know that uh, when we feel afraid or confused, we seek refuge in knowledge. We try to understand the phenomena better in order to stave off the fear and confusion. And uh, a well-constructed body of language, a well-constructed framework will actually stand the tests of the various uh, complicated questions that are thrown at us by you know, the forces of fear or confusion, right? So it's very important to be able to build a, a solid architecture of knowledge. Uh, just, the way, you know, we, just the way it's important to build great houses that are thoughtfully designed, right? So, um, so that's how we are going to start, right? Uh, and now let's look at uh, these, um, so I'm going to set sort of the, the theme of this, um, of this set of ideas by this quote, uh, which I encountered when I was browsing through the bookstore at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, and this is a quote by this artist, Cecilia Vicuna. Um, and it says, an object is not an object. It is a witness to a relationship, okay? Uh, uh, so I really like the work of this artist and it's available on the internet. She has an internet presence. You can go take a look. Um, and to my mind, the philosophical implications of this uh, observation are profound, but uh, that's not, um, uh, this is not the place to dwell or not, not the time to dwell on, on those implications. Uh, but I include this quote only to emphasize that in the real world, you have objects and you have relationships between them, right? So the next time you encounter a system or um, a setup, I want you to uh, consciously uh, put an effort in identifying the objects in the system and the relationships between them. And this is important because uh, oftentimes we want to, um, 
Uh, we focus on the objects a lot, but we somehow get lost uh, when it comes to relationships because they are not that tangible. Uh, but uh, let me tell you that, you know, just a set of objects cannot, um, uh, cannot define the system in a unique fashion. For example, uh, if, you know, people here are uh, familiar with uh, organic chemistry, for example, then you know that a lot of these molecules uh, in the subject, they consist of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, right? But uh, just, just telling people that uh, there are so many carbon atoms and uh, an X number of hydrogen atoms and a Y number of oxygen atoms does not define the molecule uniquely because the bonds or the relationships between the, the the constituent atoms is equally important, right? So objects are important in a system, but so is the relationship between them. And uh, I want uh, all of us to keep that in mind uh, when we go through the rest of this uh, webinar. Right? So now we dive right in and define the objects we are going to study, the, the vocabulary, uh, that will guide us through the rest of this webinar. So we say that uh, all knowledge systems consist of three components, right? Uh, the first component is uh, finitely many nuclear objects. So I'm not uh, going to define the term nuclear objects here. Uh, it will become clear what nuclear objects are from the examples that follow, right? But what is important to note is that uh, the, the number of these nuclear objects in a given knowledge system is always finite, right? It, you can count them, actually, All right? So that's the first. The second concept is the relationships between the nuclear objects. And these two are finitely many, okay? Again, you can count them, right? And then we have patterns of relationships. So a, a pattern, uh, by a pattern, I mean a relationship that is repeated several times, okay? And uh, to make these three, uh, these three components clear, we are going to start by the science or the art of building. And by building, I mean actually building structures out of bricks, right? So let's do that and let's go. Uh, and consider um, the art of uh, brickwork, you can say, uh, I mean, you could also call it architecture because we've been referring to it as such. Although architecture, some might argue, is a more general discipline, but let's just say, you know, we are talking about the knowledge system of building uh, structures out of bricks, right? And if that's our knowledge system, then we would like to treat the brick as a nuclear object. Okay, so this is an object and I'm going to declare this brick to be the nuclear object in the knowledge system of building uh, houses or structures, right? And now we are going to spend some time studying the nuclear object. So uh, the picture that I have uh, on the screen is familiar, uh, I'm sure to most of you. It's a brick and it has three types of faces. Uh, if it, it, and these are distinguished by the, you know, the surface area, right? Uh, the, the top, or you can say the bottom, is the face with the largest surface area. And then you have the face or the front, you can call it, which has uh, a slightly uh, lesser surface area than the top. Uh, and then you have the end, which is the smallest of all the faces of the brick, right? So that's, those are our notes on the nuclear object. The nuclear object has three types of surfaces or faces, the top, the face, and the end, right? Great, so now we know that. Now we are going to define, um, or well, we don't have to define, but we are going to observe and note down the types of relationships that can exist between two bricks. So for example, you could take a brick and lay it end to end. So the end, which is the smallest face of the brick, uh, is attached to the other end of the second brick. So that's one. You could have them face to face, which is sideways like that. Or you could have them, um, you know, uh, top to top. 
uh, one on top of each other, or you could have an end to face like this, or end to top like this, right? So that's, that's all the six of them, correct? So we've listed down the six possible relationships that exist between the nuclear object called the brick, right? Oh, that's good. Now, uh, so we have seen uh, an example each of the first two terms that I introduced in the previous slide, right? Which is the nuclear object and the relationships between the nuclear object. We now go to the patterns, right? Now here is an example of the pattern. Uh, so on the right hand corner, the upper right hand corner, you see there are uh, patterns of relationships that have been illustrated. And uh, I would like to make that kind of more explicit here. So for example, look at the stack bond, right? The stack bond, uh, can you identify what relationships uh, exist in that pattern of relationships? You've got two bricks laid end to end, and you've also got bricks um, uh, bottom top. Do you see that? Uh, uh, that's, that's for the stack bond, for example. Um, and then you've got basket B1, which is um, in the lower row, uh, the, first, uh, the first pattern, right? There, uh, we could identify uh, the relationships as, um, I think you can say end to, um, end to top or end to bottom twice. And then you've got an end to the face, right? So, so to, to the stack bond, we can attach two relationships and then just repeat them to produce the entire stack bond. To the basket view, again, we, we have uh, two relation, uh, three actually, three relationships. Uh, and, and you could, as an exercise, look at, uh, you know, uh, for example, the running bond or the herring bond, which is more interesting. Um, but I want to make uh, an observation about uh, the subway pattern. Uh, does anybody see an anomaly there? Do you see a problem with the subway pattern somehow? Maybe that some bricks are related uh, to two at the same time uh, with the same kind of relation? Exactly, exactly. We haven't uh, classified, uh, 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 we haven't thought of a relationship where a single brick is related to two other bricks. We haven't done that. Our list of relationships has only six types. And this is a new one that we encounter here, right? And how do we deal with this scenario? So uh, there is a way, I mean, we could say that, well, uh, we'll have to add another relationship uh, between three bricks, right? Where uh, there are two bricks laid end to end, and then the third brick is on top of the two bricks, but it shares only half the top uh, of each of them, right? So that's one way, that forms a single unit, right? Uh, which is a pattern, and then that pattern is repeated. So that's one way. But uh, there's another way where you don't actually have to invent a new relationship um, uh, and add to your list of six relationships, which is as follows, right? Look at the bottom row. Do you see a new relationship there? No, right? It's just bricks laid end to end. And then there's a row on top, which is also bricks laid end to end, correct? So what we could do is we could treat each row of the brick uh, as uh, a new nuclear object, right? And then uh, there is a relationship between the two rows, which is, uh, you know, the peculiar way in which uh, these bricks have been placed on top of each other, where they're kind of, there's a lag between uh, one row and the other, right? So you could either add to the relationships between the nuclear objects, or you could add to the universe of uh, the nuclear objects themselves, where the brick is one nuclear object, and then you've got a row of bricks as another nuclear object. And then you have relationships between the two rows of bricks, right? So that's, um, that's a way to deal with the subway pattern there, okay? And you know, it, if, 
if uh, people amongst you, if you guys are computer scientists or uh, you know related to the STEM disciplines, if if people are from mathematics here, I'm sure you'll recognize this as you know a, a sort of a recurring theme in all your studies, right? We we do this all the time. We have classes of functions. We have objects. We have uh, you know relationships between objects. We have methods and objects. So you know all these things are sort of uh, they have their genesis in these observations that we are making. Okay, uh, so that's good. Uh, we have now um, understood uh, or seen an example, a concrete example of patterns of relationships. And you will see that, uh, you know, incredible things can be done with patterns of relationships. So things get quickly out of hand and, you know, structures that are really intimidating can be construed out of uh, patterns of relationships and by starting with just a few objects or even one like in our case you know uh, the object in our case was one brick and then we have uh, a series of relationships that we invented by being creative and then you've got a, a universe uh, of uh, patterns that you can play around with and so what I want to emphasize here is that this is how complexity is born out of very simple rules, right? And uh, the, you know, this, this is a good illustration of that phenomenon. And now once we have some intuition about how complexity in knowledge systems is born, we can now apply these concepts to the problem at hand, which is our corpus of documents, right? So, so we we'll now go right into our corpus and identify the nuclear objects in our corpus and uh, look at some examples of relationships that exist in the corpus of documents that we are trying to survey, right? So that's, we, that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the architecture of knowledge, right? So let's look at, uh, by the way, does anybody have any questions at this point? Because this is a natural point to maybe uh, take a break and uh, maybe reflect on what has happened so far. I think okay. it's it's a lot of information. I think uh, we we have a basic understanding of the structure as as you're explaining it. Uh, right. I'm I'm not sure we're at the stage of being able to ask questions because it it makes sense, but it's it is very complex. Okay. Okay. Got it. So I think now, uh, once we start looking at uh, concrete examples of uh, these nuclear objects and relationships and patterns in, in the corpus that we have all come to know so well, because we've been working very hard on it, uh, we'll, we'll see the uh, way to apply these things uh, to, to a real life project, right? So uh, for example, um, Take this uh, bit, uh, you know, this this bit of information that I came across in one of the papers uh, when I was investigating risk factors, right? So I'll read that sentence out. It says, angiotensin converting enzyme two, also known as ACE2, is used by COVID-19 as a cellular entry receptor to infect the lower respiratory tract, right? Now look at this. Uh, look at the sentence. Uh, so what I'm claiming here is that uh, uh, we can declare the various concepts in the field of knowledge or the knowledge system uh, as the nuclear objects. So what are what is the knowledge system here? I mean, it, it's it's probably a, a useful question to ask at this point uh, and try and understand what the knowledge system is. Well, to me, it is the field of virology, the field of medicine, and the field of public health, and the ecosystem between them, right? We are essentially trying to understand uh, how these three disciplines have collaborated to uh, be able to, uh, you know, for, for humanity to be able to uh, fight the pandemic uh, that we are facing, right? That's what we are trying to understand. So the knowledge system is actually composed of three sub knowledge systems, that of virology, uh, that of medicine, and that of public health, right? Uh, so the question we ask ourselves is, okay, what are the nuclear objects in this knowledge system? So here's an example of a nuclear object. 
the angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Okay, now what is this? It's an enzyme, but we are going to uh, treat that as a substance and we are not going to delve into its molecular structure because that's, we are not interested in that level of detail. What we are interested in is that the enzyme is uh, a concept in medicine, you know. Uh, there are enzymes in our body and, you know, medicine as a field um, studies these enzymes and their properties, right? So the ACE2 enzyme, uh, we are going to treat that as one of the nuclear objects. The other nuclear object is COVID-19. Why? Because it's a virus. And a virus is a nuclear object in the field of virology, right? If, if the field of virology has any nuclear objects at all, it should be a virus, right? So that's one of the nuclear objects in our, uh, in our uh, knowledge system. And then you have what is known as a cellular entry receptor. Now that's another mechanism which the virus uh, uses to you know, enter uh, cells of the host, right? So that's, that's a concept. You can look that up as a, a term in the glossary of virology, you see? Uh, so that's uh, an example of a nuclear, ob a nuclear object. And then there's the respiratory tract, right? So we've got what? Uh, we've got uh, one, two, three, and four nuclear objects in this sentence. Uh, and also we have a relationship between these nuclear objects, which is uh, expressed by the sentence itself. So what we're saying is that ACE, the nuclear object ACE, is related to the nuclear object COVID-19 by the relationship is used by, right? So COVID-19, the virus, uses ACE2 to do what? To, uh, it, it uses ACE2 as, uh, as a method of entering the cell and infecting the respiratory tract, right? So we've got four nuclear objects and a relationship between them. And we have learned this relationship and now, we can repeatedly use this relationship in order to gain uh, understanding or act in the field. So how has that happened? I mean, we, let's look at uh, one example um, of an instance where the, the, the knowledge of this relationship, which has been expressed in the sentence, is used repeatedly to uh, to, you know, to solve problems in the field. So for example, here we know that ACE2 is good for the virus, right? COVID-19 loves ACE2 because it allows it to infect cells, uh, uh, the cells of the, the respiratory tract, right? So now we, we, we ask ourselves this question, okay, if, if the virus loves ACE2, what factors uh, affect the production of ACE2 in our body, right? And the moment we ask that question, suddenly uh, suggestions start to pop up because, uh, for example, Bunsell and uh, the others, uh, Bunsell and co-authors, they have observed that uh, the ACE inhibitors that are used uh, in, in treating cardiac patients actually upregulate the expression of ACE2 in uh, the tissues of the heart. So cardiomyocytes are basically cells that make up the heart muscles. And uh, the expression of this enzyme, or the, en the production of this enzyme, increases because of uh, certain uh, inhibitors that are used uh, while treating heart patients, right? Now, uh, now we use, uh, because we have this information, we can now use the relationship that has been, uh, that we learned in, in, the, in the previous sentence to uh, infer that, okay, if, if, the, if the production or the expression of ACE2 is going to be boosted because of certain methods, then it means that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's possible that the COVID-19 virus will find this environment more conducive to uh, infections, right? And then we, we start using ACE2, uh, the connection between ACE2 and COVID everywhere. So we ask a very general question. Okay, which documents have ACE2 expression and upregulate or, you know, or at least 
expression of ACE2, this trigram, right? Where, uh, which documents have COVID and the expression of ACE2 uh, together, right? The moment we ask this question, we'll get a lot of documents that are concerning the risk factors for uh, COVID-19, right? So this is an example of a relationship uh, that was exploited to gain more information or to parse uh, a corpus of documents. So uh, I think at this point I should stop and ask uh, if this has been clearly understood or you know, if we should discuss this and, and take time to go over it slowly so that this becomes clear because this is the main point, right? Can I raise a question? Yes, of course. Um, uh, and uh, if this is something that you're going to unpack later, that's fine. Um, I'm really loving this analogy. It's very fascinating. It's useful. Right. Um, in part, uh, it raises a critical question for me. Right. Uh, so you have nuclear objects as concepts, and you've got, a, you got um, ACE2 and cellular entry receptor identified as concepts. Right. For me, um, uh, the concern has to do with what is a concept and what is a relationship. And, right. Um, and my impression is, as I've parsed this sentence, that it's more like um, your brick is ACE2 and it has two sides. Maybe one of them, one face is the cellular entry receptor. Another um, side of it is the lower respiratory tract. And then the mm -hmm. third side is what we call ACE2. And COVID-19 is your other concept. But right. the machine learning problem that we face is in fact, how do you determine whether we're talking about a concept, a dimension of the concept, or a relationship between concepts? That's right. the analogy problem as I understand it. So um, any thoughts there? That's just um, my current confusion. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, I, I completely agree. And I'm glad you raised this point because uh, I mean, I wouldn't, uh, have had the opportunity to make uh, this, the following statement, that actually there are no concepts, there are only relationships. So a concept is a construct that you, uh, that you decide or declare by convention depending on the use case that you're looking at. So for example, you know, a molecule could be a concept, but actually, a molecule is a relationship between atoms, right? Mm -hmm. And then the atoms could be a concept, but actually atoms are not a concept because they are a relationship between electrons, neutrons, and protons, mm -hmm. right? So, so it is not clear uh, why one should define a certain uh, entity as a nuclear object, but for the context in which we are investigating it. So, if our context is to be able to build houses, then it doesn't make sense to treat the brick as a relationship between clay particles, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't affect the investigations that we are trying to perform. So in that sense, you know, uh, it makes, for example, here, it makes sense to talk about angiotensin uh, as, as a concept and COVID-19 as a concept and so on. Uh, so that's one observation. And the other remark I want to make is, you know, the, the, the analogy of the brick uh, was, you know, I, I, talk, I, I talked about the faces, but I, I would caution you from carrying that analogy too far mm -hmm. because uh, the faces are not, uh, don't confuse the faces with other nuclear objects, okay? I mean, you know, for example, uh, uh, the the... An integer could be a nuclear object, and uh, its divisors could be, you know, the 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 faces. But but that depends on what you're interested in. Sure. So sure. right. So I, so yeah. Right. So I I mean just to kind of paraphrase my um, concern, it's that uh, it's unless unless we take as a nuclear object um, phrases and just, you just accept that a phrase represents different semantic dimensions. Um, it's, it seems problematic because we never know whether um, we're mixing atoms <laughs> with molecules with subatomic particles with bricks. 
right our data set that's all i'm that's all i'm raising your attention yes to. yes and and one should be careful uh, about about uh, uh, making mistakes in that area i completely agree and that is where I feel that uh, the the advice from uh, domain knowledge experts and from uh, official glossaries of subjects uh, these come in because uh, the people who have been studying these things uh, who have been studying these objects and relationships between them they they I mean the knowledge system you know the people who have been the inhabitants of the knowledge system understand the nuclear objects better. And it's best as a data scientist to take their word for it and build on top of that because that's when you increase your chances of being useful to the community that you're trying to serve. You see? So it's better to ask the experts what the nuclear objects are. And of course, uh, we don't always have uh, access to actual human experts. But what I found by experience is that glossaries that are you know, published uh, in books or um, uh, other online literature are frequently helpful. So that we, we learn the alphabet by talking to the native speakers. Uh, I would like to say it like that. Uh, yeah, uh, any other questions here? Yeah, I just wanted to pinpoint, there was a, a comment here in, in the chat raised by Tina. Uh, oh. that it really resembles uh, the user story format for people that are familiar with the product management and writing requirements for commercial products uh, because mm -hmm. people typically describe functionality uh, in a way of saying as a user I want to do something so that something happens so okay. that would be also an analogy for people that are coming from entrepreneurship or product or any kind of product management uh, absolutely right? Absolutely. Thank you, Tina, for pointing that out because I, uh, you know, I personally am part of the industry and I talk to my stakeholders and we often have this experience of, uh, of dealing with these patterns and relationships. So, yeah, I mean, this, this is uh, for all bodies of knowledge you know, and, and so many situations. Uh, so Jack Park, uh, he seems to have uh, paraphrased this one. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I, I can include references um, uh, to, to the material that inspired this webinar, uh, but I'll do that once I finish talking. Um, and somehow I cannot locate my cursor. Uh, anyway, uh, it's fine. So suggestions on a survey. So, uh, you know, because now uh, I have made the observations that I, that I wanted to make, I just wanted to sort of give a few suggestions on uh, the problem at hand. And uh, the first bullet point I've already sort of uh, talked about because of the question that was asked. Um, and that is, um, guys, it, it makes uh, complete sense to first uh, review the glossary of the subject or what we can call the elements of, let's say, virology, or the elements of medicine, or the elements of public health. You know, there are lots of books that uh, that, uh, that 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 talk about the elements in a subject. You know, the elements of geometry, for example. And there is a reason why these titles come up. It's because you know there are literally elements, and we try to understand relationships between them, right? Uh, so let me give you an example of uh, an advice that I received from a friend. Uh, so, so my friend, she's, she's, um, she studied biology more than I have, and uh, she's good at, uh, you know, finding these terms uh, sort of to describe uh, conditions. And uh, so uh, in, in the first task, there was this point where uh, they have asked us a question which, which goes as follows. How long can a career, a carrier, be uh, be capable of transmitting the virus after they have recovered, right? And you know, so this is we are describing a person who has once had the infection but is now okay, but still capable of transmitting the virus. And I wanted to sort of have one word or at least maybe two words to describe this condition of the individual. And what my friend told me was that 
uh, such people are called convalescent carriers. Now that is such a such a handy term to have, you know. And once you have that, you can actually make a statement like, okay, there is information about convalescent carriers in the literature or not, right? And that really, you know, such uh, such pieces of advice from experts in the field or people who are familiar with the field really helps, right? So uh, always, uh, I, I always go to people uh, to to uh, to get a handy list of nuclear objects. So that's one thing. And uh, the second, uh, for us, the relationships uh, are usually, you know, relationships between two objects are usually expressed by their presence in the same language unit. So in our case, the language units are usually in the same paper or the same uh, paragraph or the same sentence, you know, such things. So if we, if we see that two units are present or mentioned in the same paragraph or the same sentence, uh, they may be related in a way that uh, we think or at least we'll get to investigate the relationship between them, right? So that's the second uh, tip I want to, uh, or, or, or sort of, you know, the second observation I want to make uh, with regards to discovering relationships. And then uh, the second, uh, the third one is uh, what techniques can be used to map these relationships, uh, you know, in an entire corpus. So I personally uh, like cluster maps because, you know, I'm, I'm a geometer, so I deal with vectors naturally, and vectors, they sit in an n-dimensional space, and it's easier to talk about distance between vectors. So for me, cluster maps are a handy tool. Um, I will not have the time to go over what cluster maps are, per se, uh, but you know we can catch up offline and, and talk about it, and also Seaborn uh, has a, a library de devoted to cluster maps. Uh, but then there are also network diagrams, and I'm not an expert on network diagrams in Python, but you know, people who understand uh, how to build nice network diagrams, um, you know, uh, have a very handy tool at their disposal to actually map these relationships between various nuclear items. So, you know, I, I sort of wanted to take you guys through this uh, uh, particular cluster map that, uh, that corresponds to the first subtask in, in the risk factors uh, <laughs> category. And there you'll see, for example, that COVID, uh, you know, or, or if you look at the column of COVID, it's brightly lit up at certain parts, not everywhere. And the places where it's brightly lit up, that's where, you know, it, it corresponds to articles that have the word COVID in them, right? And uh, think of all the imaginary uh, horizontal lines as uh, arrays of numbers. So they're vectors and wherever each horizontal line is brightly lit up, it means that there is a high value to that uh, place, uh, you know, uh, that uh, position of the vector, right? So if, for example, we wanted articles that have COVID and uh, let's say smoking together, uh, then you'll see that there is a corpus of articles which mention COVID and smoking together, but you see the intersection is really small and you, you have to really, you know, squint to get it, right? Uh, so that just shows how, you know, uh, how uh, sparse the literature is uh, in mentioning COVID uh, and smoking together. But coronavirus, on the other hand, has more literature uh, on smoking as a risk factor. Not, not like a whole lot more, but still it's easier to locate these documents in the cluster map. Right, so that's uh, that. That's the sort of remark I wanted to make. And then once you have uh, this bigger vocabulary uh, fixed, you can then uh, sort of investigate the the sub parts of this cluster map by forming these you know sub clusters. So for example, here you see that uh, coronavirus and smoking they they they're mentioned quite often in documents that have an SHA of F8B53 and FBE double F3FB, right? So that's that's sort of the um, uh, you know that's how I've used these cluster maps to come to um, the the list of relevant articles uh, in the notebook that I've built. So so uh, these uh, these methods of visualization and there is need for uh, there's a there's a uh, you know, there's still an existing need to come up with uh, ways to visualize the, uh, the knowledge map uh, 
in the sense that I just described. That is, you have uh, the objects, the nuclear objects, as uh, the nodes and uh, the relationships uh, depicted in a suitable way. It could be the edge of a graph, or it could be some vector like this, which is color coded, uh, or you know something else. But but uh, my it is my invitation to all of you to think about how we can. Uh, depict these maps and show them to experts so that they find it, you know, easier to say that, okay, conclusively we know that uh, literature in, in which covers these two concepts is sparse or we need more work here or enough work has been done here, you know, that sort of thing. So, so that's, um, that's one note I wanted to make about the visualizations. And finally, I have notebooks and I think you have the, uh, the paper, you know, the, 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 the PDF. So these links are there. You can go and look at um, the methodology has been described in great detail. And if you have any questions, of course, uh, you can reach out to me offline. Uh, so that's, um, I, that's all I had to say uh, uh, by the way of the webinar, but now we can open the floor to questions. Amazing. Thank you so much. It makes 100% sense. It is complex though, but you know, we're, we're not working on some uh, simple things here. So yeah, exactly. thank you so much for um, presenting this to us. And yes, this is the perfect time from Q, uh, for Q&A. We still have 10 minutes. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Um, maybe I should type in the name of the person responsible for these thoughts as such by, you know, at large. So. Alexander, so Christopher. Christopher Alexander, um, you can say pattern. So Christopher, uh, he's still alive, by the way, he's quite old now. Uh, and he, uh, you know, he's spoken to computer scientists quite extensively about his ideas in architecture. And I think uh, to a lot of us who code a lot, uh, it will make sense. It will make us better programmers. It will allow us to think about our algorithms with more clarity. So I invite you all to look at the work of uh, this man who has changed uh, the field of architecture and urban planning uh, to a great extent. So um, I want to I want to raise a, a general concept that um, kind of plagues me in this work. Um, I'm thinking from the standpoint of um, uh, language as a problem in and of itself, mm -hmm. as an object of study, and um, it's that uh, there are, for every sentence there are uh, n unknown um, presuppositions, which is um, assumptions. Uh, that go into the statement. One example, for instance, is that term that you introduced, which explains both the relationship and um, a person, uh, a person who's recovered from or is recovering from COVID-19, and you can give it a label. Right. Um, I treat uh, a research article as a set of instructions for building a house. And the researcher, the, ex the expert, is trained to understand how to read these instructions and wants guidance on how to summarize all these instructions. But the instructions are idiosyncratic in what they leave out and what they include. Yes. And, and then if we return to the language and its particular role, the yes. problem has to do with knowing when a sentence is incrementally expanding on the prior sentence when it is presupposing new information that is obvious to the ex the expert and then the yes. deepest part of the problem is if you talk to an expert they make presuppositions about what you already know yes and what you don't know and uh, we run into precisely the same problem when we try to think of what questions to ask them yes we pre presuppose things about machine learning right uh, they, we don't know they don't know Yes. And, uh, so the lack of shared assumptions between papers, the expert, and yes. the machine learner or um, uh, the programmer um, creates sort of this sort of lack of communication or clarity in resolving the architecture problem. Yes, yes, I completely agree. Uh, 
Thanks, thanks for that uh, uh, remark. And you know, in, uh, in relation to that, I would like to make this uh, remark by uh, the filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky. Uh, he says that, uh, you know, a book read by two people is actually two books. Yeah, and a, yeah. a good thing on this point, Mark, and I think, like, obviously we're trying our best to address this uh, extreme uncertainty of multiple agents uh, trying to figure out how to talk together and figure out some missing pieces. And I think the best way we, we can do it right now is actually present the wrong answer and, you know, potentially get feedback on, on what's wrong. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Um, in these situations, I've often encountered that, uh, uh, you know, this mechanism which uh, Arthur just, uh, uh, you know, pointed to works best. Uh, you just, you know, sort of be shameless and, and go tell them what you think. And if, if, you, if they think you're wrong, they'll tell you. Um, and that's one algorithm that works uh, quite well. Yeah, and I think that's how internet in general works. Whenever yes. someone says something that is wrong, you get hundreds of people that join that conversation in attempts yeah. to, to fix that person. That's how Wikipedia essentially works. Yes. You know, uh, if no one writes about something, uh, mm -hmm. no one participates in fixing it. But if there is someone that creates Wikipedia page, all of a sudden there are all of these experts that jump on board. Yes. Right. Do we have any other questions? All right, then uh, I think we're good. Uh, yeah. Again, thank you so much for, for doing this. Um, obviously, we're rushing towards the first Kaggle submission. And right. hopefully we integrate as much of this feedback as possible within yes. the, the limited time constraints. But I think it's actually very, very valuable piece of knowledge in itself, structure for other teams to understand how to position ourselves to create that, you know, potentially uh, a product, a platform for any knowledge expert to be able to come in and do their um, work much more efficiently and basically figuring out how to provide a tool for them to do the between the lines uh, type of meta analysis. Because yeah. essentially we had a call with that epidemiologist and he told us very specific value proposition for him. Like these things typically take me month to do. And I mm -hmm. think you guys can reduce it to a couple of days and not mm -hmm. only helping me find stuff, but also validate if my hypothesis is worth pursuing, which right. is another kind of dimension of the, the, the value for, for the researcher. Yes. Yeah. I think that's an appropriate summary of the discussion. All right. Sounds good. All right. Thank you everyone for jumping in. And right, thank you all. Again, uh, there is Slack and you can always ask follow-up questions and message Cigar uh, directly too. Yep. All right. Thanks, guys. Yes. Have your help. You all have a great day. Great. Thank you.